Stop messing around, stop fooling around, stop delaying, stop procrastinating. Get up, get out, get it done. Everything is possible, nothing is a problem, and anything can be overcome. I just get my ass up out of bed, I get my shit together, and I get out and I start the fight. And that will transform you from uh, a mere mortal into a superhuman being. I've never, ever, ever met anybody who told me that they got rich watching their IRA or their 401k. Welcome back, Peter. Hey, George. How you doing? I'm good, man. What do we got today? What do we got today? Today is a video from the School of Wrestling. You can never have any team chemistry Nick Saban. for this reason. Mediocre people yep. don't like high achievers. Mediocre people and don't like high achievers, don't and like high achievers don't, don't like mediocre so people. That's true. The same principles and values the people like to be around the their own standard, kind when it comes to mindset. You're never going to be successful. Yeah. Incredible stuff. So I love Nick Saban. Winning is... I think he's the winningest football yeah. coach of our time. Well-respected guy. I've always been a fan of his. And he says zingers like this. Like, occasionally he drops these zingers. They get out there. That draws me to him even more. People like to be around their own when it comes to mindset. Misery loves company. You've heard that. Yeah. Success loves company, too. Success doesn't love misery. You know, people like to congregate and be around each other if they're like-minded. George, I've gotten rid of all the negative big anvil weights strapped to my ankles. Like I've gotten rid of all those people in my life. Over time, it took time, it wasn't easy. Some people were close and near and dear to me. I still love them, I just can't hang with them on a day-to-day -day basis. It's like, I get up early, I get up, I go, you know, I'm like duking it out every day. They're like drifting along, like whichever way the wind blows. It's not, not for me, you know? And, and so I don't wanna be around that. So I, I choose to be around other people who have got the same kind of energy and the same kind of goals that I do. I find that most people are mediocre and I find that they don't like successful people. They're angry it's not them. They're jealous it's not them. They've done everything that they thought they should do in order to be successful, but yet they're not successful. So there must be something wrong with the world or the successful people must be cheating or they must be criminals or there must be something else that's wrong and we should attack the successful people, regulate their businesses and make it so that they can't be successful because clearly there's something wrong in the world, right? People who think like that, it's tough. It's a rough world out there. Life isn't fair. We have to find our own ways to stand out and be successful and provide for our families and do what we need to do. And people who think like this, George, it's hard for me to find commonality with that type of mindset. So I, I just don't. I, I, I choose to be around entrepreneurs and business people and top achievers and people who are motivated and want to learn and grow, like I index towards that kind of person. I love that. I feed off of that. I share the energy. It's a really healthy thing for me. And I think if most people are honest with themselves and they really look at the kind of people in their immediate circles, they're going to see that they choose to be around people who are like them. How many of you out there are choosing to be around people who are not like you, who you aspire to be? How many of you out there are choosing to be around champions in your particular field and you can have proximity to one and then you're, you're near them all the time? How many of you are indexing towards the best of the best? How many of you want to be around winners all the time? George, I can't stand being around complainers. The whining and complaining that goes on in our world, like that I can't deal with. I, I get what the coach is saying here and I, th I think there's a lot of truth to it. So I challenge everybody out there, who are you spending your time with? We've all heard Show me your five friends and I'll show you your future, right? So who are you spending your time with? Who are, you, who are you hanging around? Who are the people in your inner circle? Are they winners? Are they losers? Are they complainers? Are they action takers? Because if you're around five action takers, you're going to be the sixth. And if you're around five complainers, you're going to be the sixth. Yeah, I mean, I've had some experience with this. There's people that have been part of my inner circle for a long time. And, they, you know, they still are. I love them. I care about them. But I just can't hang with them day in and day out, like I can't have the same type of interaction with them. They don't want change and they're happy with their mediocrity and they complain about everything. Yeah. Complain. And I just, I can't complain. Yeah. I don't want to be part of a world where I'm complaining and not doing anything about it. That makes sense to me. All right, we got this tweet. You want to read this one for us? This is uh, from Jeff Feldman. You want me to read the tweet from Jeff Feldman. Yeah. All right, I'm going to take my eyes off the camera to read this tweet. Jeff Feldman, don't just buy real estate 
Build your story, your track record, your execution, your goals, your competency. Oh, I like it so far. Your story is one of the most powerful ways to raise capital and attain good financing. Who's getting capital now on tough deals? Let, let's just break this down a little bit. I mean, he's not saying anything terribly profound, but I do like what he's saying here. Your track record, your execution, your goals, and your competency. Build that stuff. Your track record, execution, goals, and competency. Man, we talk about that every day. You got to have goals to shoot for it. You have to be able to execute. You have to build a track record and gain experience in order to be compelling when you tell your story to someone. George, anybody can go out and buy real estate, make investments, buy businesses, anyone. All it takes is money, and that's not such an exclusive club to be a member of. So what this guy is saying is get out there, build your track record, gain experience, get competent, and really competent in this stuff, move towards your goals, and execute. Man, he's dead on. Like anybody can just go write checks and buy stuff, but are you overpaying? I mean, we're seeing a lot of that now. And watch, the shoe's gonna drop soon. Rates went up 75 bips today, it's September 21st. You know, it's going nowhere but up over the next multiple quarters. And watch what happens. Everybody who's out there running around with money, they're not gonna be so busy and they're not gonna be ringing the bell so much because markets are changing. They've already changed. Right under our feet, right before our very eyes. You got to build competency. You got to be able to execute all different types of markets. Just when times are good, anyone can do it when times are good. Anyone can do it. So what they can't do, though, is build a base of competency and achievement of goals and execute. I like what this guy's saying. Yeah, I think the key thing I keyed in on was the story part that, you know, build your story. It yeah, reminded me of how you've talked about building your brand and being very intentional about building a brand that people trust and know and recognize. Your story is the accumulation of all the little details that aggregate, that you achieve on your path. It's everything put together. That's your story. It could be a lot of home runs and a bunch of base hits. It could be just nothing but base hits, but it's all part of the story. And if you care to execute well and build your competency, you're gonna have a great story to tell. You don't need grand slams and home runs. You need to be moving forward, you need to learn, and you need to adapt and move forward. Move the ship forward. That's a great story. Make sure you're moving forward and that's part of your, your story that you're building and you're gonna be golden. You know, but anybody can just go out there and write checks and do things that require no skill set. Anybody can go out there and run around and buy real estate with no experience. I mean, we all know people that are doing that. It's bananas, they're gonna be eating shoe leather soon. So what most people can't do is go out there and invest with them proper mindset with a proper goal and objective and execute and make money and be successful over and over and over and over again. Your story is the aggregation of all the little moments that lead up to right now. And tomorrow, you're going to fill that story with even more moments. And next week and next month and next year and so on. So make sure that you're always moving forward and you're always aggregating those small wins. And don't look down on those small wins. Those small wins all together, you got good confidence, you got a good track record, all because of your small wins. Build your story. Mm -hmm. Don't look down on the small wins. I love that. All right, I'll see you over at the table, Peter. Thanks, George. All right, Peter, how are we doing? George, I'm good. Doing good? Yeah. All right, fantastic. I usually start this off with providing context for the question, but I'm going to start with the question first. By all means. So so we got, what are three or four challenges that first-time property managers are bound to come up against, and how can they overcome them? So the reason I'm asking that is the number of homes taken off the market without going under contract rose 58% in August compared to the year before. There's nothing selling. Yeah, nothing selling. And so a lot of people are transitioning to renting their homes instead of selling. Next best thing for these people. Yeah, but we've talked a lot before about how it's not something to be taken on lightly. And so I was, yeah, wondering what are some of those challenges that they're going to come up against, you think? So I know some people who are now recently landlords because they couldn't sell their house. And they're like, shit, what do we do? So they rent it out. And they haven't yet crossed the dark bridge, Mm. right? So Mm -hmm. what happens is first there's like this emotional experience that people go through where they're like, oh, it's my house and now I'm renting it out. And now there's people in my house. And like, get over that. That happens to everybody. Like, get over it. It's an asset. You can either live in it yourself. You can rent it out. You can sell it. You can, right? All those things. Totally. But like... Get over the emotional part of it. Stop making this emotional. It's an asset. It's business. You got to handle it like a business. Inevitably, the toilet phone starts ringing. So I don't know if you remember my story. My brother always used to give me a hard time about being out to dinner with me and my 
my second phone would ring and it'd be like, Peter, my toilet's leaking. This is when I was first starting and I didn't have a lot of help and I was taking the maintenance calls at nine o'clock on a Friday night. So inevitably, these new landlords, their toilet phone starts ringing. They have to pick up the phone at inopportune moments and they have to deal with whatever the call is. And people hate it. And people, actually, this is the number one reason why people shy away from being rental landlords. Yeah. Because they're like, I I don't want anybody calling me. Mm, Being on call. I want want people to call me. If people call me, that means we're in business together and like they need something for me. And it's like, great. Look, I'm not saying I want people to have a hard time with me, but it's better than the phone not ringing at all and not being in business. If you're going to rent out your property, expect the calls, maybe get a second phone, maybe figure out a call forwarding service or have like an on-call super or handy person that can take a call for you in certain times when you can't receive a call. But you got to figure out a system for that because you're now getting the calls. Inevitably, the number two reason why people shy away from being rental landlords is the tenant relations aspect. Not only do they not want the phone ringing at inconvenient times of the night about leaks and maintenance calls, they don't want to deal with tenants having their number, saying, when can you do this? When can you do that? Calling and and making calls to you and like people don't want that you know again it's not a big deal for me I'm already in the property management business so it's it's part and parcel for being an owner of real estate so okay by me but you have to get over the hump tenant relations are a big part of it your tenant is your customer they're paying you money you don't need to give them much just the basics clean safe secure quality product they agree to enter into a lease with you like after that you don't need to do much. Just like be nice. And if they call, let it go to voicemail or not or pick it up or call them right back. But you got to have a tenant relations sensibility about you. You can't ignore the tenant relations part. George, the guy last week who said that he was scared to walk through the front door of his house because he hadn't been there in a year. Zero tenant relations. <laughs> right, like totally. what's that person yeah. thinking? Don't do that. Yeah. Like have some sort of strategy for tenant relations. Use email, text, like whatever works for you. Set the ground rules with your with your tenants, but you need to have something in place and it needs to work for both parties and you need to do it. You can't avoid it. So that's a big thing that people shy away from is the tenant relations part. You got to dive right in. Don't avoid it. Jump right off that cliff and get going. I like that reframe of actually wanting the calls, actually wanting that interaction. I want people to call me. Look, I'm not saying I want people to call me at three in the morning and complain about nothing. But like if it's major, like or if it's I don't know, like I want people I want to be in business. I want to be in the mix. I want to be in communication with with people. Well, it's even part of your lease. You you say about how you can't sit on, you know, maintenance calls and all those kinds of things. Like you want all those things to be done with a sense of urgency so that you can have that connection. Yeah. Like this guy last week, I feel like he rented out his house and then just went to Mexico for a year and then came home. And he's like, oh, I'm scared to walk through the front door. Well, if you go to Mexico and you check out, I, I can understand why you'd be scared to walk through the front door of your own piece of property, by the way. It's not like a stranger's house. It's <laughs> right. your house. So I, I don't understand the distant, disconnected, not being involved approach to managing property. You heard me say it yeah. every week. I'm, I'm getting blue in the face from repeating myself. I just don't get it. So bad choice. Get good at tenant relations. Get good at dealing with the phone ringing for maintenance calls. You have to get rid of the emotional concept. George, the last thing, you're now going from being a primary occupant of your home, living in your own house, to now renting it out to someone else. Local laws and regulations now need to be dealt with. You need to be in compliance. Perhaps in your town, you're required to have an inspection before the tenant takes occupancy. Perhaps in your town, you're required to get a certificate of occupancy before the tenant moves in and you give keys. Perhaps you have to do annual or quarterly registrations for health and safety and rent registrations and other state and local requirements. You have to do this now. You're renting out your property for for money. It's a business. You now fall into that business landlord category. You know, you probably didn't have to do a lot of these things before when you were just living in it as a primary residence. But as soon as you rent it out, check with your local government offices in your cities. Make sure you're in compliance with, with whatever the rent laws are. You'll, you'll be surprised. There's a lot of laws that govern what you can do with your own property. We're seeing it everywhere. Some allow Airbnb, some don't. Some allow short-term rentals, some don't. Some don't allow rentals at all. 
So you have to be aware of what your local regulations are. That's going to drive you nuts if you're not prepared for it. So just get prepared. My four things for you. Don't be emotional. Fix the leaky toilet when you get that call and don't avoid the call. And make sure you're deploying a good, sensible tenant relations program, either text or email, phone, whatever it is. But don't be annoyed when they call you because they're going to call you. And four, make sure you know what's up with your local rules and regulations. Visit your local government offices. Make sure that you're stopping by code enforcement. Make sure you're stopping by housing and community development, whatever the local office is that runs housing regulation, and make sure you're in compliance. It's going to be new for you. You're not going to like it at first. Not such a big deal. Yeah, And we talk about it pretty much every week that those local laws are changing all the time. All so the time. So you've got to keep on top of it. All yeah. the time. Yeah. So Open Door lost money on 42% of resales oh, in gosh. August. <laughs> So, you know, we already had the Zillow. Is this another story about the algorithm? Essentially, yeah. I mean, like, this feels like a perfect example of everything we talk about, which is, you know, seeking cash flow, appreciation not being guaranteed. So, Open Door. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Open Door is another one of these outfits that, like, raise some money and they're out buying houses according to what some algorithm's telling them to do. Mm -hmm. And they thought they were going to sell them for a profit. Yeah. And guess what? They sold them for a loss. They probably weren't close to their asset. They probably bought in markets they had no local knowledge. They probably bought in areas where they had never done business before, where they engaged expensive third-party advisors and consultants to feed them opportunities of assets to buy, uh, all from behind a desk on the 27th floor of some office building. I mean, that's my guess, because real estate's very local, and you can't deploy the same strategies and tactics and analyses in New Jersey, as you do in California, as you do in Illinois, as you do in Idaho. You just can't. You need to be localized on the ground and be able to execute according to whatever the landscape is in that local environment. You know, these guys don't do that. They're using an algorithm to say, buy, 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 buy. And then they sold everything and now they're eating crow and they're losing money. So yeah, it's it's like that whole Zillow algorithm thing, I, I just, rolled my eyes when that happened. I roll my eyes when you tell me about this with Open Door. What do you expect? Your new rates are rising. And anybody who knows that rates are rising, who's been through at least one cycle, knows that as rates rise, prices drop and markets chill. Where, where's the surprise here? Yeah, I think in the Zillow case, I remember a story where a guy had sold his house and then they came back to him and sold it back to him and he, he made a profit. It was like the same, same buyer-seller Look, situation. Yeah. yeah, it was rough. Uh, I, those types of things I don't know about because yeah. those are great, but they're not, it's not nature and it's mm-hmm. not science. Yeah. It's like lucky and unpredictable and random. Yeah. Uh, but what I do know is the nature and the science and the nature is that when rates go up, markets chill and prices drop, yeah. period, end of discussion. So for these guys or anybody else to think that they're going to be listing inventory and selling in this rising rate environment and making money. You know, I remember my first beer, too. (laughs) So you sent, a few weeks ago, you sent me this about, we're running out of sand. Oh, that's an incredible, that's an incredible, I'm glad you brought this up. Yeah, insane. So, I don't know, I I, I can give context, but you you were the one that sent it to me, so I want to, if you want to kind of... I'm read, I, I, read, yeah. I read about construction industry stuff, housing policy, housing industry, economic. I read about all this stuff. Up comes an article. We're running out of sand, the kind of sand that we need in the construction industries that we make concrete from, that glass is made from, right? Building materials, raw materials, sand, the good stuff. It needs to come from pits and quarries and riverbeds and rock beds and the appropriate places. And it's got to have the right composition, not the stuff that you find on a beach in Bermuda, because that's not the right sand, although it's beautiful sand and I wish I was there right now. (laughs) But it's a crazy thing because here we are at the cusp of an incredible construction housing supply shortage and we need to build, build, build. And a lot of places are trying to do that. But they have to import. I think. I think in Saudi Arabia, right, with with the yeah, with the line, with the line, they have to import sand from Australia. Yeah, which is so ironic because they're surrounded by sand, but it's not. The all right it is is yeah, sand. Yeah. They have to bring it in from Australia. Yeah. How bananas is that? Yeah, construction grade sand. Yeah. So now, if you're in the sand business, maybe it's a good time for you because prices mm. are going up. Yeah. yeah. But an incredible thing. You would never think. At least I never stopped to think. Like, oh, I wonder if we have enough sand to meet our construction demand. Right. I never thought that in my life. And I read this article and I thought about it and I stewed on it. I'm like, holy shit. Like, they bring uh, bring up a good point. Well, then you start realizing all the things, like you said, glass and concrete. Those are two huge components of all construction. I mean, that's that's what it is. You know, there's some wood. Okay, you don't need sand for wood. 
we, yeah, we talked last week about the environmental uh, you know, pivot. Now we got to have a pivot for, for sand depletion. Well, look, you know? this, is, this is why a lot of these new construction technologies and techniques are going to flourish. They're going to start to proliferate and become way more popular because you can use alternative materials. There's alternative prefab, pre-constructed, assemble-on-site things that don't require traditional construction materials, sand, glass, wood. You're going to be able to do that, and you're going to be able to achieve the construction and development of a structure in a factory and then deliver it and assemble it on site, and perhaps there's less of traditional materials that are going to be used in those cases. 3D printing, I mean, that's concrete, so there's, there's sand in that. So they're going to need sand, but a lot of the alternative material, like compressed, pressure-treated hemp and recycled plastics and everything that I'm seeing out there is this really cool stuff. A lot of it hasn't entered market adoption yet, but if it does and when it does, it's going to really blow away a lot of the traditional building materials. So right now, I think we need a lot of sand, and I am expecting that as this stuff moves forward, we're going to need less and less of the traditional stuff like sand. So you're not feeling it in your supply chains as of yet. I don't feel it. If I I, look, if I need concrete, I can get concrete. Yeah, I I probably have to tip the guy or pay him a little extra to get there on the day in the moment that I need the the pour. But typically, I can get concrete. Uh, There was there was a while during uh, the height of the COVID pandemic in 2020 and 2021, you could not get concrete at all. Wow. Well, that was labor shortage. That was material supply chain. It wasn't sand. It was just like everything else. But the sand thing is just a bizarre, you know, like I I think about the earth and the raw materials. I'm like, yeah, we don't have a lack of sand, you know, like that. That's the one thing we have a lot of. But no, the good stuff that you need to build with. We don't have enough of it. How often does that happen with you mentioned, like not being able to get concrete at all? Like you say the market works in cycles, obviously. But is that like a three times, four times in a lifetime, or is that like a couple times a year? Like, what's that kind of situation? Well, that yeah. depends on the frequency of your need. I know someone who has a very high need for mm. concrete. Yeah. Like, on a weekly basis, she's pouring foundations yep. and building high-end homes, and she couldn't get concrete. Yeah. It was only because of her 30 years in the business and her long-standing relationships with the, the materials providers, mm. they agreed to make deliveries, and they took care of her, but she had to wait and she had to deal with uh, the constraints of the supply chain like everyone else. It depends on what your need is. If you're only building one house, you only go through it one time. If you're building new stuff all the time, then you're going to have more wear on your shoes, so to speak. No, that makes sense. Yeah, I remember you had mentioned the the cabinets, uh, delaying cabinets, 13 weeks or something like that, but you you have to make If I was lucky, it was 13 weeks. Yeah, so you have to do those communication, you know, finesse. I'd take 13 weeks. It was like, it was like 30 weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 50, you know, 50 weeks in one case. Yeah. That wasn't fun. That's insane. But if you only go through it once, God bless, you only go through it once. Yeah. I went through that stuff for, and I'm still going through it for two plus years now. Yeah, it's interesting. It's one of those things you wonder, you you don't want to go through it, but at the same time, if you've gone through it multiple yeah. times, it means you survived the first time. So I guess you're doing something well, right. Well, <laughs> if you go through it multiple times, you go, oh, I'm getting killed. Oh, I'm losing money. Oh, this sucks. Mm-hmm. But the alternative is to pack up shop and go home. I right. won't do that. Yeah. So I just grin and bear it and try and get through the economic hardship and the delays and the change of budget and the change of timeline, all that stuff that makes me want to hurl myself into a big body of water. Yeah. Yeah. But hopefully get through it in a, in a better way than the last time, you know, that's uh, their whole mistake thing, you know? Yeah. But so the next time you're looking to pour concrete or get a hold of some concrete and they can't get it to you, ask them, is it because of the sand? Mm, Like I'm curious to see what they say. (laughs) They could say, no, our truck drivers didn't show up or no, we didn't get the other materials or whatever they may say. But if they say, sorry, Peter, it's sand. We don't have enough sand. I want to know. Let me know. Have you guys been able to get uh, concrete or not because of sand? Like, I'm really curious to know who out there in the construction and development business has had a hard time getting concrete because of sand or glass. Because you know, of sand. Yeah, I would also be curious to see at what point do people become aware of that? You know, at what point in the supply chain are people saying, oh, this is a sand issue or yeah. they're just saying, well, we can't make it. Yeah, yeah well, that's academic. I mean, the bigger yeah. issue for me is that there's just not much you can do about no, it. No, of course. Yeah. Because you can't replace the concrete with something else. Yeah. And you just got to sit around and wait until they can hit you with a yeah. delivery. A few months ago, I remember us talking about the metaverse 
And yeah. you said people were asking you, oh, are you buying land in the metaverse? And what did I say back then? I think you said something along the lines of, oh, maybe I should, but I'm not right now. I but I didn't. Know. I didn't you buy did, land yeah, in the metaverse. Yeah, yeah, you didn't. And now the metaverse prices are down 80% oh, in six months. Go like, figure. Those, those, those real estate, you know, virtual real estate. I'm like, trying to buy land in the regular verse. Right. Yeah. Like, which I know about and I can touch it and feel it. The metaverse, I never understood it. I never bought land in the metaverse, but... There's some smart people out there that raised real capital and started mm-hmm. buying real metaverse properties. Yeah. And perhaps they did it at the cresting wave of the cycle for metaverse product. But look, they were first movers. And if they missed out, someone else would have bought that property. So who knows if they made the right decision? Time will tell. But right now you can buy it a lot cheaper than you could six months ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're probably out there continuing to buy those metaverse landowners. You funny guys, you, <laughs> the metaverse landowners. Yeah, do you think this, like, does this illustrate a weakness in the market itself, or is this just kind of natural? This is what like, happens. Growing, growing pains of a new... This yeah, is what this, happens yeah. in new, early, incipient phases of industries, and it also happens when economies are taking a crap, and right now, ours is taking a crap globally. Uh, the rising rates cut off access to capital and cheap capital and cheap financing for all sorts of things, businesses, real estate, growth, development, renovations, whatever. It was a lot easier to get money before when it was less expensive than it is now where it's more expensive. People are like, I'm not going to borrow at these higher rates. You know what takes a dump first? Alternative assets, metaverse properties, cryptos, uh, stocks, like all of those things go down when interest rates rise. It's called correlation. Look into it. It's been around forever. If you're new to investing, understand these concepts because There's a right way and a wrong way to manage through this stuff. As rates are rising, you want to hold more cash so you can deploy and take advantage of lower prices. That's the world we're in now for the next couple of years. A 30-story FIDI office building was recently sold for, I think it was $180 million. Uh, they converted it. A what a, building? A FIDI, a financial district. Like, uh, is it FIDI or FIDI? Fi- is it FIDI or FIDI? I, I've always said FIDI. Do you guys know if it's FIDI or FIDI? Let's do a poll. Yeah, audience, let us know. Okay. Um, but yeah, Wall Street, Wall Street building yep. uh, for 180 million, and they converted it into I think it was 571 apartments. Yeah, and then this is happening also in LA. I think the office LA conversions. Thing. Yeah, that's a huge yeah. thing right now. Big. Do you feel like with zoning and kind of structural constraints, is this really just something that's going to be a handful of conversions, or is this something that could be sustainable long term? I think convert? it's a long term trend. We yeah. have to find ways to repurpose, reuse, and give new life to properties that were built a long time ago that have less relevance in today's world with the people and how they consume living and working in space. We already know that people are coming to the office less, although that's a bit of a tug of war, but it's definitely different than it was pre-pandemic. It's it's going on. They're coming to the office less. They want more organic spaces, better spaces, big, bright spaces. You heard Lindsay Ornstein from Open Impact talk about if you have some benign space in the back of a building without good light and air and without good circulation and access to common areas, it's no one's going to rent it. And so these spaces have to have new life breathed into them. And this example that you're referring to is the conversion from office to residential. We need more residential across all price points and all income levels, but we need more housing of all kinds. Here's 500 something units that are coming online from the conversion of office into multifam. I think it's great and we're gonna see a lot of it. You know, the cities have a lot of these buildings that are like this on, on the coast and all the cities. There's a lot of old buildings that were built for the way people lived and worked a long time ago. It's different now and you can't just go out and demolish a building. I mean, you can demolish it, but it's probably more cost effective to keep the bones and keep the structure and renovate the inside. So we're going to see a lot of that stuff. And that's what needs to happen. We're going to pick up thousands and thousands of new housing units from office buildings having been converted in all of these places and cities across the country where there is an oversupply of underused office space. I know typically you purchase apartment buildings and then do value add, you know, kind of renovate within yeah. that asset class. But do you ever do conversions like this with either office space? I've or never converted from like that. No, yeah. I've never converted from office to multi. I've yeah. built ground up multi. Mm-hmm. I've taken existing multi and done value add, as you just said. Yeah. I've never converted from office to multi, but I'm open to doing it. Right. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. You, Look, I'm an, I, I, I'm an opportunist. I'm, I want to make money in real estate however I can make money in real estate. So if 
converting a building from office to resi is the way to do it, and I find that great opportunity, I'll be all over it. Yeah, has the reason been in the past that's just not something that you had been done before well, historically? That, that, was, that, it wasn't a, yeah. that wasn't really a market or a thing <laughs> right. prior to now. Yep. So I, I wouldn't have had a whole lot of opportunity to build a business and really move the needle uh, if I went to go do that 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, but you know, now we're going to see a lot of those things. I've heard you quote historian Will Durant before. He said, we are what we repeatedly do. Mm. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, what do you repeatedly do? What are the repetitive (laughs) actions that have contributed to your kind of persona? If you you ask my wife, (laughs) she'll tell you that I'm a clean and neat freak. Oh. So I'm always organizing and keeping things clean and neat. I don't like a dirty house or a dirty kitchen or a messy room or like I it just for some reason it it bothers me yeah. have you always been that way uh I think the more successful I got the mm. more I was like that yeah I can remember when I was younger and I was probably less so but there was a time in college when I was living in the dorms and it was the cassette tape era so I had all my cassette tapes lined up and organized perfectly mm. over my desk in my dorm room and the older guys would come in and they'd look and they'd be like, oh my God, Siegel, what's up with you? I'm like, what? They're like, you're so organized. You'd be a great treasurer. Like, you'd be a great... And like all of a sudden they were concluding other things about me because my cassette tapes were all lined up perfectly. Yeah. So I, I think I was a bit of a neat freak back then uh, during college days yeah. uh, in my late teens and early 20s. But the reason I mention it is because I'm like obsessive with it. And mm. I think I think that obsession is is the same thing as what makes me want to do a good job no matter what the job is or task is like I always want to do a great job and achieve excellence and the way you do that is by caring and by managing the little details and the small things and the aggregation of those little and small things over time add up to uh, a bigger thing that you're winning at or that you've achieved and all of that together over a track record, it's part of building the story that we were mentioning earlier. Yeah. My story is, I like wins, and I want to I want to check the box and have a W in my column, not an L. So it may mean a single, a bunt, a double, triple, whatever it is. But I just want to get on base. I get on base a lot, and that is what helps me do well in mm-hmm. business. Yeah. So I just you know I'm obsessive about being clean and doing what it takes to be clean. I make yeah. my bed, my closets neat. It's very military almost. I, well, I believe that there's a lot of discipline in the military and, yeah. and the methods that they teach. And I, I can understand why you would say that. It's, yeah. it's a very similar parallel concept. Yeah. But there's a lot of discipline in it. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm obsessive about things that people wouldn't think are important. But like I think you need discipline to be successful. I think you all need to be creative and be able to wave outside the lines. But I think you need discipline to be successful. Like it's not... An accident. So the discipline is knowing what the boundaries are, figuring out the systems, figuring out how it all works, executing within those boundaries. I saw somebody posting today about how motivation is, you know, somewhat overrated that, you know, it's fine. It's it's good. It's nice. It's like I think Tony Robbins often said it's like a bath or something like that. But but that, you know, you still need another bath the next day. But discipline is something that will carry you on. I agree with that every every day. I've heard that people say motivation is overrated. They say manifesting is over. Look, Mm -hmm. you know how I feel about manifesting it's yeah. like all right enough of the manifesting yeah. like get, now get off your ass and go do something yeah, do it works no, totally. yeah so yeah. manifest for like a half a second mm-hmm. and then for the rest of the day work yeah and, yeah. and grind yeah the, the cleaning thing reminds me of your quote the details drive details that's the kind of feel, they do detail yeah. george yeah details drive details did you hear that i did hear that you just it, said that I, I just said it it's details your, drive details your words amazing yeah. <laughs> they do we'll get those those t-shirts will be the first ones we create that, it's amazing yeah. people think that like success and big wins are just a luck mm-hmm. or like a lucky accident like oh my god they won the super bowl how lucky like i, I you know or oh my god he's a multi-millionaire or, oh my god she's a billionaire they're so lucky or, is it luck because that stuff does not happen by Especially accident to everybody. I, I think people really don't understand the concept of how a billionaire is created compared to a millionaire. I think there's there are many millionaires in the world. There are not very few billionaires in the world. And so, yeah, the, the things that have to accumulate. To, Do you remember when you were a kid yeah. and yeah. you, I don't know, you played with Lego sets mm. and you sat there for hours and hours and just 
put the Legos together and when something didn't fit, you undid the whole thing and started over and rebuilt it back up. And if you got one piece wrong, you'd undo it down to that one piece and rebuild it back up and go even bigger and better. You remember that? Did yeah, that yeah. ever happen with you? Yeah, yeah. Every young kid I know has some equivalent to the Lego set or if it's a dollhouse or whatever it is, they mm. obsess over it. Like that's what it is later on in life mm. when you're a grown up and you're trying to be successful and achieve. Like it's the same thing. Obsess over your Lego set or whatever it is mm. and like don't stop until you get it right. It's an amazing thing to watch young kids do that because when young kids play, like they're having fun, mm -hmm. but they obsess over these little things in the in the venue of having fun with a toy, right? You're seeking they're, excellence even within the yes, playtime. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's an amazing thing yeah. to watch. Harness that and carry that forward to when you're an adult in a career, navigating the waters of life in the world out there, right? Like, be obsessive. Yeah. Like, obsessive people have discipline. They can, they can focus. They can grind it out and get a win and then get another win and then get another win. And again, it's the accumulation of all those wins. But I think it's such a beautiful sight watching young kids play and when they obsess over little details in their, in their play scenario, mm -hmm. It's amazing stuff. You had this quote from David Mamet, to be yourself in the universe that's constantly conspiring to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. So when I read this from him, I immediately stopped everything I was doing and I just pondered it. I was like, mm. oh, that's heavy. To be yourself in a world that's conspiring to make you something else, it's a great accomplishment. Yeah. Think about that. Like the world, everybody's pulling at you. Everything's pulling at you. People want to sell you. They want to get you to vote for them. They want to get you to buy their product. They want to get you to live here, buy, sell, go, don't stand yeah, up, don't like speak me. your voice, spit down, don't say, like everybody wants you to do something and be something. But what do you want to do and be, right? What, what's the answer to that? How many people don't know the answer to that? But the people that know the answer to that and they can be themselves and they can be who they are without these outside influences impacting their natural path so much. I mean, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. To be yourself in a world that's conspiring, that's the key word, conspiring to make you something different yeah. is an amazing achievement. Conspiring, it's like, it's like not only is it happening by forces that you can't control and you don't see, but like there's a wizard behind a curtain somewhere actually scheming on how to change you, on how to, on how to make you think differently, act differently, live in a certain place, buy a certain product, right? There's, there's wizards behind these curtains conspiring. What a word. That word makes the quote huge for me. Conspiring to make you something different. How do you feel like you've done so far in working against those conspiracies? Oh, I think we're all cogs on a wheel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's it, difficult. It's difficult. Even, even the guy that lives out in the middle of the woods in like West Virginia somewhere mm -hmm. who is totally off grid and he just lives on the land yeah. on public land or something like, you know, he even has to come out of that every once in a while for, yeah. a, for a, a shower and a change of clothes or something. So he's yeah. got to be on grid. So yeah. he's even exposed to it. I forget this guy. It's like yeah. this crazy story of this, this dude that was like once in the corporate world. Right, right. And now just like did a coal 180 and he like lives in a tree house that oh, he wow. built from logs on public land wow. somewhere. But, you know, it's hard. Yeah. We're, we're a world of consumers and the engine that's out there is designed to get our dollars and we can choose where to spend money based on the messaging that we get, the advertising, the agendas of the different machines going on out there that we're exposed to all the time. It's really hard. Yeah. But... Look, people who are true to themselves, who can be themselves in today's world, it is a great achievement. And sure, if you go into Gap and buy a pair of Gap jeans and a Gap t-shirt, that doesn't mean you're sucking on the teat. <laughs> right. You know, you yeah. need you need a t-shirt and you need and you need jeans. Yeah, like, it's not that big a deal. So don't don't give me a demerit for that. But <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that are having a tough time being themselves or even mm. knowing who they are to be themselves in the first place because the world's yeah. conspiring. I think conspiring. That's the, yeah. I think that's the key is, is knowing whether or not you are being yourself in any given moment. There's a lot of people that don't even know. That, well, if your feet are firmly planted on the ground, you yeah. likely know who you are and where you're going. And if they're not firmly planted on the ground, you don't. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I love this quote. I love the, the implication of it. And I love the word conspiring. Mm. That changes every, that one word makes the whole, the whole concept yeah. just come to life for me. 
I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Captain Fantastic. Probably not. It's a Viggo Mortensen <laughs> film. And it sounds ridiculous. That title sounds ridiculous. Uh, but it's about this kind of... I'm aware of it and I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, so that situation you're talking about with the guy in West Virginia, it's basically that where he's yeah. off with his family, off the grid or whatever. Um, but it's worth a watch because it, it's it's certainly about kind of this concept of yeah. being yourself kind of no matter what, but figuring out how to do the balancing act of living in society as well. At the end of the day, you have to be able to go to sleep. You're by yourself with your own thoughts, beliefs, actions. You know, you have to be able to live with that. You have mm. to be able to sleep well at night. So if you know who you are, you'll be, you'll be able to sleep well. And if you're struggling and flapping in the breeze and sucking into all the the messaging and the communications and the advertisements and the politics and the craziness of life, you're going to have a tougher time. Yeah, the system. The system. <laughs> uh, anything else we want to talk about before we head over to Q&A, Peter? Uh, and thinking about anything, ruminating on anything? I am ruminating on things, and I'm hoping I see more of it, but what I saw from St. Paul, the city of St. Paul, they reversed their stance. Did we talk about uh, this? About the rent control situation, Yeah, did right? they, yeah. they reversed. I, we haven't mentioned the reversal, no. Yeah, well, yeah. a year ago they enacted the most restrictive rent control our nation's ever seen, yep. and now they're backpedaling oh, and, wow. and yeah. re- retracing that decision. Huh. Uh, because it killed housing starts. Yeah. Nothing new got built. We have a supply shortage. Yeah. They needed things to get built. Nothing new got built because they overregulated it. They got it wrong. And they said, well, we got it wrong. We have to loosen it up. And I applaud that. Look, it's not an easy thing to do to enact legislation, go through all that work, the PR, the voting, everything. You get that support. You enact this legislation. And then not long after, within a year, you're, you're doubling back and undoing all of that. Yeah, I applaud them though. Yeah, to say, yeah, it's, to say it's, you're wrong. Yeah, yeah. It, it, look, it's they tried it. It didn't work. They were able to say it didn't work. Yeah. And and I'm seeing other examples of housing policy and uh, restrictive legislation loosening up a little bit. I want to see more of it, guys. We got to build more supply. Our governments and city councils, mayors and governors, they and they alone are in charge of housing production in our communities and in our states. They and they alone. They're the ones who dictate how much can get built. We need things to get built right now. Guys, you got to loosen it up and take the rope off our necks and you got to let the machine go and we need to build housing. Well, thanks so much, Peter. I appreciate it. I'll see you over at Q&A. Thanks, George. Peter, Q&A. George. Q&A, Q&A, Q&A. Let me see. We have a question from Ralph Kaczynski today. <laughs> I wish that was the name. That'd be a fantastic name. Today is Cheryl Bradley. Cheryl Bradley. Hey, yeah, Cheryl. So, so Cheryl says, I've been having a rough month with my tenants. Yeah. Could you share an interaction with a tenant or customer that was so great it'll give me hope? Or can you tell me a horror story to make me feel better about not being alone? Your choice. Cheryl, why all the drama? Why all the problems? The landlord-tenant relationship doesn't have to be so difficult and so troublesome. Listen, as a landlord, here's what you want. You want the tenant to pay on time, and you want them to call you and communicate you when they have a need that you need to deal with, a repair, a maintenance call, something else, lease extension, right, whatever. Here's what the tenant wants. The tenant wants to be left alone in their apartment to live quietly and enjoy the premises quietly. They don't want to be hassled by you. If you need access, arrange access, but otherwise, you want them to pay on time. You want them to let you know if if you got to fix anything, and that's pretty much it. Work towards that as a start. It's not that tough. Be kind, do it with a smile, send gift cards or whatever as appreciation tokens, not difficult to do and doesn't cost a lot of money, but it's not that tough. Mm. George, we were talking last week about someone who had all this drama about renting out their house and they hadn't been there in a year and they're (laughs) so scared to walk through the front door. I don't get it. Why are we scared to walk through the front door? Why are we avoiding having the interaction with our residents. Mm. Our residents are our customers Mm. in any business. We want to be able to reach out and have dialogue with our customers. And so I don't get why there's all this off-putting feeling in the landlord-tenant community. It doesn't need to be that way. Just do it with a smile. Be a normal person. Say, hey, how can I help you? Yes, I can do it. No, I can't. It's not that tough. It shouldn't be so difficult for people 
with their own real estate, with their own properties, with tenants that they screened and allowed into occupancy of that real estate, it shouldn't be so difficult. Mm. Just mind your P's and Q's, do it with a smile, stay on top of it, provide a great service, and f- be friendly. I think you're good. Yeah. All right, get your shit together, Cheryl. I think so, Cheryl. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. All right, thanks so much, Peter. I'll see you next time. Thanks, George. If you like what you just heard, you can subscribe to The Daily Cash Flow on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And we'd love it if you left us a review. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at SiegelCap and on Instagram at Siegel.Cap. As always, if you're an accredited investor, go to SiegelCapital.com and take our survey to see if you qualify to take part in one of our apartment building deals. That's S-I-E-G-E-L Capital.com.